Did you know that there are two kinds of people in the world? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's true. It's what the Bible teaches. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who belong to God and are thus sealed by his Holy Spirit. And there are people who do not belong to God and thus are not sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the people who belong to God are made right because of God, not because of their own works or their own righteousness or their own anything. They bring nothing to the table but sin. All people universally have this in common. All people who are alive today, Jesus, of course, was the only exception to this. The only thing that we have to give to God is sin, which, of course, is, is provocative. It's not helpful. It's scandalous, right? Um, I suspect that this is not a popular um, kind of teaching, particularly in the church, whenever you're trying to, you know, pack the pews or, you know, pad your pad your budgets or whatever, uh, convince people to give because of 501c3 or some such thing. But uh, there are two kinds of people in the world. And by the way, this is the second in a video examining the question, what is the human spirit? And so in this video, we're, we're examining, uh, the first video we examined general principles that apply to all humans and all humans have a human spirit. Okay, in this video, we are examining those humans who have a human spirit, but the, the spirit is an old spirit or the spirit is a spirit that has not been renewed by God and does not belong to God. And therefore, what are the, the sort of caveats that apply to them? And so John eight forty one through 47. Uh, so Jesus is talking to people. Um, he's, he's taking a rather different approach than the church would like, come on in, please come to our service. Please, please, please. John is giving a completely, or uh, Jesus is giving a completely different kind of sermon. He's not begging these people at all. He's actually calling them children of the devil uh, because that's, that's what they are. Okay. Uh, so John 8, <clears throat> excuse me. John eight forty one through 47, ye do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. Okay, so there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who God has chosen and there are people whom God has rejected. And Jesus is, and he's knowing it. Of course, we don't have a knowledge of who, who is who. We don't have those sort of spiritual eyes or something to see that. But Jesus does know. The Holy Spirit has revealed it to him. He knows. And he is calling out people as not uh, belonging to God. Now let's go to um, read Ezekiel uh, 36, 25 through 27 and see what the, the basis is for an old spirit, this spirit that these people have. Um, Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And so in verse 26, whenever Ezekiel God through Ezekiel says a new a new heart and a new spirit a new spirit implies an old spirit if it's really the same spirit then it's not new at all is it and the word new doesn't have any meaning right and so the the reason why we're told that God is going to give a, the people whom he 
he does this action, this external action of cleansing from filthiness, of giving a new heart, of giving a new spirit, of putting the Holy Spirit. And this is this is the com- most complete definition, by the way, of being born again that I know of in all of Scripture. Um, new heart, new spirit, Holy Spirit. It's a complete inner renovation. Um, just because, incidentally, there is a start to that inner renovation does not mean it is utterly, completely finished. The kingdom of God has come. You are resurrected with your new spiritual body and there's nothing else to say. The way that the Bible talks about salvation in and the way that the New Testament authors talk about salvation is have been saved, are being saved, will be saved. And so the, the, the Bethel... Reading, California folks who say, oh, you've been saved. You're a new creation, period. Nope, nope, you're new. Nope, you don't have a sin nature anymore. I mean, that that the only way that they, you can get that to work is if you cherry pick five verses out of the Bible and you ignore the other 33,000 verses out of the Bible. And then you say, oh, oh, here's my five verses. Ooh, 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 I'm truer than true, right? But whenever you take the whole council and just, just the whole council of the New Testament, bother to read the whole revelation that God has given and not just your little part, right? The Again, the New Testament authors talk about three modes of salvation and two of them are in either in progress or haven't happened yet. And so the, the idea that it's just done and there's nothing else to say about it is um, short-sighted, to put it politely. Um, and so w- what are some of the the implications of these people who are children of the devil um well first of all before we look at that let's let's consider exactly how this death happened okay and so you you recall in Genesis chapter 2 uh verses 16 through 17 and the Lord God commanded the man Adam saying of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat it for in the day thou shalt eatest thereof thou shalt surely die Okay, and so the the spirit that man had, whenever he disobeyed God, he rebelled against God. He his sin separated him from God. The spirit died. Okay, that doesn't mean that it ceased exist existing. It's not personal extinction. Whenever Adam in Genesis chapter three, I mean the fact that God issued a judgment for him, right? He obviously didn't die. He was obviously still there. But a separation came into place between his soul and his spirit and God because he rebelled against God and his sins were separating him from God. And so the way that the Bible talks about death, and I'll I'll talk about this here in a minute, is not personal extinction. Everybody, every created being is immortal. Now, God is eternal. He has no bound on either side. He was never created. He never started existing. And he will never stop existing. We did start existing, right? And so we have a a bound on one side. But then on the other side, moving forward, we will live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. People who go to hell will live forever and ever and ever. People who go to heaven will live forever and ever and ever. And it will never, ever, ever, ever end forever. Okay? So... We'll talk about that here in a second. Ezekiel 18, 4, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And so whenever a person experiences physical death, that person, uh, the, auth- the author of Hebrews says, you die once and then comes the judgment. And so you die and God says, you're guilty. You have no, you have no defense away with you. And so you become, you experience two different ramifications. You are separated from God forever, and you are also thrown into eternal torment and punishment, which is ultimately called the lake of fire. This is what the Bible teaches, okay? Isaiah, Isaiah 59, chapter 59, verse 2, But your inequities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. This is what sin does, and this is why we need a Savior, because sin separates us from God. And incidentally, we can't ever stop sinning. We continue 
sinning, even whoever the most spiritual Christian is, they continue sinning, 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 right? And they need a savior. They need a, a savior to rescue them from their own sin. They need a savior to pay the price for their own sin because they, they themselves can't bear it. So um, let's just examine this second death issue for a second. So this, this spirit that's in a man who has not been sealed with the Holy Spirit, it is dead to God, even though it still exists and it will always exist. And the Bible teaches that death is not personal extinction. You just whoop, don't exist anymore. That's not what happens. You continue existing, but you, uh, after your physical death, you will exist in a substantially inferior state. And that's not inferior that you don't have like cognitive ability or rationality or self-awareness or something. It's suffering and it's torment and it's being paid back for wickedness um, forever and ever and ever and ever because that's... That's how a holy God pays back his enemies is he destroys them in fire forever. That's not not something that I, I not something that you would want, not something that anybody would want. And of course it's also not a popular doctrine in the church, right? You're trying to, you know, convince people to make a decision for Jesus. Um uh you're not, you know, going to risk offending people by telling them that they're filthy, wicked sinners and they're gonna go burn in hellfire. Um it's not a popular message, but nonetheless, it's a biblical message. You, of course, you recall um, whenever Jesus um, first uh, started um, preaching, the very first thing he said was, repent, the kingdom of God is near. And that message, repent, is, is, is a message of, of changing your mind, of turning away from sin. And, it is, uh, and there's a consequence that is associated with it. If there's no consequence, if there's stop sinning, you're sinning because you love sinning. But stop sinning or else, but there's no consequence to stop sinning. The reason why you're sinning is because you love sinning. So why would you stop sinning? There has, there has to be a consequence to it. Or else the, the, the message, repent, the kingdom of God is near, is, is utterly irrelevant. It's utterly, utterly impotent and empty and irrelevant. And nobody would ever, ever, ever respond. Ex you know, unless if the Holy Spirit of God moved on them, in which case... Uh, you know, God's grace is irresistible and they would respond. But uh, God punishes his enemies and he destroys them. And it's not, it's not pretty and it doesn't make them or, or I, I don't, I don't think it even makes God feel good, but he demands perfect justice. And so that's what he does. Um, so Revelation chapter 20 verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which we just heard is called the second death. And so being thrown into the lake of fire, even those people, some people came out of hell and then they go from hell to being cast into the lake of fire. Those people still exist. It's not like they cease existing. It's just they're going from one state to another. Um, uh, clearly a, a worse state a suffering state, a tormented state. Um, Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 through 8. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, idol idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so that's where they're going. Um, and so can you imagine like being thrown into the cauldron of, of lava of a volcano? And so you're kind of like a lake of fire. And so you're like being tormented night and day and day and night, but you can't die because you're immortal. And so you, you just are stuck in, in the suffering and the fire and the torment and you can't ever escape it. Like I, I just telling you what the Bible teaches. That's all that I'm doing. Um, all right, so let's examine some of the characteristics of a new spirit. And I say, you know, God doesn't have to save anybody. 
And so like the, the fact that, that he takes our wickedness on himself and is willing to save even one person, like that is above and beyond, utterly, utterly, like like the, the fact that God allows anybody the possibility of, of being saved from that um, sentence and that judgment is, a, is an incredible mercy and an incredible kindness that God just doesn't remotely have to have to give. Um, so we already talked about um, Prophet Ezekiel saying we have a new spirit. Um, and so this, this footnote that I'm going to read is... Um, on the verse Second Timothy one seven, um, you can find it in the um, section three of the book. Again, the book is a work in progress, final draft, but it's in the nine hundred pages, uh, in the nine hundred range. I'm not going to give you an exact page because the ch- pages are probably going to change a little bit, but um, it's the section that doesn't have green or yellow dots next to the scripture because they mention the word spirit but they don't have, um, they're not the Holy Spirit. They're talking about some other spirit. Um, So 2 Timothy 1.7, this is the footnote that's on there in the book. The book is linked in the description. Uh, A new spirit implies an old one. Perhaps this is descriptive of the old human spirit that is dead to God. Ezekiel is not speaking of the Holy Spirit in verse 26 because he states in verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. In addition to the new spirit, this old spirit is contrasted with a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind that is either the new human spirit or God's spirit. I guess I should actually read Second Timothy one seven. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we can see that there's two different spirits and they're human spirits that are being contrasted in um, Paul's letter to Timothy. Um, we can put together a profile of this old human spirit. Uh, number one, it is ruled by fear. Romans eight fourteen through 16, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Um, obviously, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is not bearing witness that you are the children of God, right? Um, number two, that old spirit is under the dominion of Satan. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Again, if you don't have the spirit which is of God, then you can't know who God is. Right? Um, Ephesians 2, 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And I want to read one more verse that's actually not in this footnote, but it is in um, 2 Timothy uh, 2, 24-26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves or in opposition, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And so they belong to the devil. They um, ultimately will go to where the devil goes, which is the lake of fire at the end. And because the devil is a, a powerful spirit, he takes them captive and makes them do whatever he wants to do. Now, if you ask somebody, an unbeliever, and you say, does the devil take you captive and make you do whatever he wants? Probably most people are going to be offended and going to be like, um, I don't think so. I do what I want to do. Um, I don't believe in the devil or the, uh, the devil ain't around here or some such thing. Right? They're going to deny that the devil influences them. But then again, I mean, Christians are going to deny that the devil influences them. Most people are going to deny that, that there's some kind of an external influence upon them because the, what are the implications? The implications are I don't have my free will. I'm not in control. I can't do what I want, what I want for me, me, me. How, how, how can I feel good about myself whenever I'm a puppet? And something else is utterly, utterly, utterly controlling me. And I can do nothing about it but be controlled. Well, well, I can tell you what I can do. I can come up with a lie 
in a delusion that makes myself feel better and say, oh, well, that's not happening. That's what I can do. That'll make me feel better. Okay. Uh, number three, it is a spirit that yields falsehood. Micah 2.11. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be a prophet of this people. And so another way to translate this, if a man walking in the spirit of falsehood. And so um, the devil, we just read in John 8.44, the, the devil has no truth in him. He's the father of lies. And so those who belong to the devil, who are children of the devil, they uh, don't have, they don't understand the truth. They can't come to an understanding of the truth and they walk in a spirit of falsehood. Um, number four, the human spirit is defiled and thus separated from God. Second Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and of spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so the spirit is defiled. It's filthy. It's an abomination to God. It is um, not delightful to God in any way, um, shape, or form. Um, and so in the next video, we're going to talk about what it means to have your spirit renewed. This only happens at salvation. The gospel is repent, believe, receive. Whenever you confess your need to God. I saw I saw a sign on a truck one time that said, God only forgives you when you realize you don't deserve to be forgiven. But of course, a, a prideful, self-sufficient person says, I don't need to be forgiven. And they strut about and say, I'm going to do what I want to do and it will last forever or something like that. You know, they don't take in, they're not interested in being accountable for anything. They're only interested in doing whatever they happen to feel like doing at the moment. Um, when a person acknowledges their need for God and they humble themselves before God and they believe that God has provided um, a sacrifice for their sins, um, that God has provided redemption and hope and life. That is whenever you receive the Holy Spirit and one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is begin the process of giving you a new spirit, a.k.a. renewing your mind. Um, restoring your soul as a promise out of Psalm 23 and making you a new creature. Um, that process, again, the Bible talks about have been saved, are being saved, will be saved. The process of becoming a new creature, it is exactly that. It is a journey. It is a process. It is not some presto change of thing. If there is anything in a new believer that is a presto change of thing, it is receiving the Holy Spirit. Because once you have received the Holy Spirit, you have received the Holy Spirit. That's not to say that you can't receive more of the Holy Spirit, but once you have him, then you are sealed and you can't be unsealed and you can't be more sealed. Sealing is sealing, period. Okay. So in the next video, we're going to talk about um, what it means to have the new spirit and to be sealed with the Holy Spirit.